My name is Joshua Strange. I was a student at Auburn University back in 2011. I started in 2009, my freshman year. My name is Allison Strange. I am the mother of Joshua Strange, who was a student at Auburn University um, starting in 2009. I watched my, my child grow from a precious, precious little guy to a very handsome, well-adjusted, personable, happy young man over the course of his uh, elementary and junior high and high school years. From the time he was a little kid, um, he wanted to go to Auburn. We have no idea why. He just saw it somewhere, sometime, and fell in love with the school and wanted to be a tiger. We came down, he walked around the campus, he was in his glory. And when he got accepted on his 18th birthday, that was all he wanted. It was his dream come true. In 2011, I got into a relationship with this young woman uh, at Auburn. She was a great girl, very sweet, very kind, uh, very pretty, and everything seemed great. In May of 2011, he called and said he had met a girl, and he, I could tell he was smitten. I could tell from his voice. And that was May of 2011. And in June of 2011, he actually called and asked us to come down to Alabama for a weekend to meet her. So my husband and I knew at that point that this was um, important. Over the summer of 2011, uh, one night, uh, we went to the bar and we were hanging out with everybody and we were having a few drinks and uh, we decided at, at one point it was time to time to go home. Well, we went back to my apartment because she had essentially been living with me uh, for the past few weeks. And we get back to my apartment and we fall asleep. Uh, later on in the night, uh, she woke up and began initiating sex and, and everything like that. And we started to have sex and then all this, and everything was consensual, everything was fine, everything was normal. And then about halfway through, she all of a sudden started getting upset and, and she said it one time and I'll never forget when she said it she she said no stop and at that point everything ended everything everything stopped I stopped um, it, it was it was over at that point and she just continued to she was just upset I, I couldn't figure out why she wouldn't tell me why so I decided to leave the room and give her complete control uh, of, of the situation so I left the room and, and stayed away and later on all of a sudden the police are there I have no idea why they're there and they uh, put me in handcuffs take me down to the municipal building which is basically the the police headquarters but they don't really tell me why or what's going on I, I have no idea uh, unknown to me at the time uh, my girlfriend uh, was taken to the East Alabama Medical Center here in Auburn, or actually it's Opelika, Alabama, which is the next town over. She was taken there and uh, they took a rape kit on her. I have no idea what the results were, but at the same time, later on that, that evening after I had given a statement about, about what happened and they asked what happened in the room and, and what was going on, the officer walked in and said, okay, we're going to take you home. And that was it. And they, they put me back in the squad car and they took me back to my apartment. Here I am, 20 years old. I'm dazed and confused. I have no idea what just happened to me. But they, they took me home and, and let me out of the car and said, all right, have a good night, and drove off. And that was it. And later on, I got a phone call from my girlfriend saying she wanted to come back over. Oh, we needed to talk. And I said, okay, that's, that's yes, please. I have no idea what's going on. So she came back to my apartment that night. That morning, it was probably about five o'clock in the morning or so at that point, she came back over and she comes up and we sit down and, and we start talking and she's like, I'm sorry, I just, you know, I had, a, I had a moment, you know, everything was fine and then I just, I started getting upset. I don't know why. I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. You know, everything's fine between us. I'm going to go, go back to sleep. Are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just going to sit here on the couch and stare at nothing because I don't, I still don't understand what just happened. Like that was a whirlwind and a lot of things are going through my head at that point and so she goes back into my bedroom and falls asleep and after 
the events of that night, which it was June, uh, June 29th, 2011, we continued to date. We continued the relationship. I mean, every, everything went back to normal. Like it was just, it was almost like a bad dream and everything went back to normal and we kept dating. Throughout our relationship, she had been uncomfortable with, with some of the close relationships that I had with some of my female friends, which is understandable for a girlfriend. But when we started talking about us getting back together, uh, I raised the point of, here I am, I've done all of this for you. You know, I've backed off of relationships with girls that I've never had anything sexual with. We've literally just been friends the entire time. It's not a big deal. You know, there's, there's nothing going on there. I had some concerns about her relationship with her ex-boyfriend, someone that you used to sleep with, and I'm just really uncomfortable with how close you are with him. And, and if you could do me the same courtesy as I've given you of backing off of my friends, that would be awesome. That's when all of a sudden she got mad at me and started yelling at me, and, and I never raised my voice at all. And she storms out of my apartment, and before uh, she could storm down the stairs, I kind of walked out the door and I said, listen, if that's gonna be your reaction to a very simple request, something that I've already done for you, I terminated the relationship and, and that's when all of a sudden all of this, all these accusations started coming out. Oh, well, well he raped me. He you know, was, was mean to me, he was violent towards me. We had no idea that there were any, any misgivings or any ordeals or any situations that had come up. Um, I think looking back on it now and after Josh and I have talked about it, I think he realized that if he had let us know of the events of June the 29th and the way that she had handled things and the way that she had misconstrued what had happened, um, that we would have pulled the plug on the relationship. I, I am fully, fully confident that Josh knew we would have said you're done with her and we won't, we won't condone this relationship. She stormed off and I stayed true to my word. I never tried to get in touch with her, never had anything else to do with her. And that was in late August of 2011. And then early September comes around and next thing I know I'm getting arrested by the Auburn City Police Department and put in the back of a squad car. A apparently I had confronted her in a parking lot of a, a local business in Opelika, I think it, I think it was Opelika, um, and apparently assaulted her in the parking lot. While in reality, I was several miles away in downtown Auburn hanging out with a few of my friends. It was September the 6th of 2011, and I was sitting in a chair watching a Braves baseball game with my husband at home in Spartanburg and the phone rang and the caller ID showed Josh's number. So I picked up the phone and, and with my usual, hey bud, how are you? But it wasn't bud, it was his best friend, Tim. And the voice said, Mama Strange, this is Tim. Um, Josh has been arrested. I thought it was Josh and Tim pulling a joke on me, so I, I chuckled and I said, Tim, put Josh on the phone. He said, I would never joke about that. He's in the back of a squad car. Um, I don't know why. They didn't tell him why, but they read him his rights and they handcuffed him and they're taking him to Lee County Detention Center. I had never had any contact with her since late August. I hadn't done anything at all. But here I am being arrested for something I didn't even do. Apparently I started screaming. I don't really remember that part, but my husband, thought that Josh had been in an accident or something horrible had happened, something more horrible had happened. So he grabbed the phone and said, where's my son, Tim? And the next thing I knew, it was 10 o'clock at night and we're trying to find a bail bondsman and we're trying to make arrangements to drive to Auburn in the early morning hours of September 7th of 2011. We got to Auburn early that morning. Josh met us in the parking lot. Um, we had bonded him out. And then later on, uh, she takes the, f the fake charges, the, the faked assault charges, and takes them to the university, and then compounds the event of the evening where we were at the bar and we had gone back to my apartment. She then throws that into the mix, now claiming that I raped her, 
when in reality, I hadn't done anything wrong. Everything was consensual up until she said no. And then the second she said no, I, everything ended. Everything stopped. She had filed a complaint for the beating charge, the lie, the fraudulent beating charge with the university. And then she used that lie to get the university to go back in time to allow her to file a rape charge against my son. Now I'm being accused of raping my then girlfriend who even after the alleged incident happened, she continued to date me. It, it didn't make much sense to me. He said, I don't know, Mom. I don't know why I was arrested. Nobody would tell me. They took my fingerprints. They took my mugshot. But they never told me why, even though I kept asking, why am I here? And I, he said, they told me that I can go by the uh, municipal building and pick up a copy of the complaint and see why. He said, I can only imagine that it relates to something, Mom, that happened back on June 29th that I didn't tell you about because I thought it was over. He said, there was a misunderstanding and um, the police were called, but our state, and he went through the whole story, God love my child. He had to tell his dad and me the most intimate parts of a sexual encounter that he had with his girlfriend. And I, to this day, don't know how he was able to do that because I know it was hard and embarrassing for him. There I was, you know, a 20 year old college student who is now essentially being labeled a rapist by his university. And it just all went downhill from there. We made an appointment that afternoon. We called a law firm locally that afternoon and made an appointment for September the 8th, which was a Thursday. We got up early that morning on September the 8th and drove directly to the municipal building. We picked up a copy of the complaint and it said that he had been arrested for beating her up in a parking lot on Sunday, September the 4th, 2011. And I said, Josh, where were you Sunday? He said, I was downtown Auburn with a bunch of friends. Mom, I have witnesses. I wasn't there. I didn't do this. I can prove I didn't do this. I said, great. We will meet with an attorney today. We will get this all straightened out. We met with the attorney. He said, I can, you know, take care of this. But he said, I need to know everything that you know, everything that may come up because I don't like being blindsided. So he asked, the attorney asked his, uh, Josh's dad and me to leave the room. And Josh sat in there and he told this complete stranger, this, this attorney, the whole story about June the 29th and about where he was on September the 4th of 2011. And we thought that it was going to be okay because we could prove that my son didn't do what he'd been accused of doing. And then we started getting the complaints from the university. It was a very beyond broken university system that, that I began going through. And even though the sexual assault rape charge was filed second because it's a more serious charge in the legal system, uh, it was heard first. And they decided at the student hearing that I should be recommended for expulsion for something I didn't do, for a crime that I didn't do. Uh, all the while, I'm still facing legal charges and, and legal investigations in, in the legal world. I'm now being recommended for expulsion from Auburn University. We walked into the University Student Center with Josh and our attorney and Josh's witnesses for the June 29th incident, and the campus tribunal began. His accuser was there. She had also brought an attorney advisor who happened to be the city prosecutor from the municipal hearing that was going to try Josh later on for the beating. So immediately, Josh's attorney advised him that because his attorney had to be a silent advisor and could not represent Josh actively in the disciplinary hearing, that Josh needed to remain as silent as possible to not make a full statement in his own defense because anything that he said in that hearing, particularly in front of the city prosecutor, 
could be held against him in the criminal court system. So Josh was basically silenced. He presented his witnesses, who were very strong witnesses. Um, she presented none except a student, the Title IX coordinator, and the assistant secretary or assistant director of public safety for the university, both of whom stated that they didn't know the details of the purported rape, um, but that she looked like a real victim because she cried a lot and they didn't feel the need to re-victimize her by making her tell them the story or the details. So there we sat. There was really no evidence that my son had done anything wrong. He wasn't able to give a statement in his own defense. Mr. Strange, you are alleged to have violated section 2.2.B.1, sexual assault and or sexual harassment of the Auburn University Code of Student Discipline. We find you in violation of the Code of Student Discipline and the recommended sanctions are expulsion from Auburn University. Do you have any questions at this time? No, sir. Okay. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. We found him sitting on a bench with his hands in his, with his head in his hands, devastated. His lifelong dream of being an Auburn Tiger was over or was nearing an end. And we couldn't stop it. We couldn't tell the truth. We couldn't make anybody hear the truth. Nobody cared. He was a number. He was a statistic. He was the way Auburn was going to show the federal government that they were doing what they needed to to keep their Title IX funding. That is my take on it. The city decided to present the, uh, the rape or sexual assault case to a grand jury, and the grand jury came back with a no bill. The no bill is basically, there's not even enough to proceed to trial. Like the, they obviously could see that, that I had done nothing wrong, or, or they saw what, was, what this event was. The the recommendation for expulsion then went from the disciplinary committee to the vice president of student affairs. We thought surely he'll listen to the tape recording, surely he will read the transcript from the protection from abuse hearing in court where she said that Josh, she did not believe that Josh intended to rape her. She said that under oath in a protection from abuse hearing. Um, apparently the vice president did not listen to any of that. He just upheld the recommendation. We had five days from that date. Um, it was the end of November. Five days to file an appeal directly to the president of the university. We got the appeal in in five days. She was supposed to have five days then to file a response to his appeal. They gave her six weeks. In the meantime, we paid tuition for the spring. We thought that she wasn't going to respond. We thought that the Auburn University president would, president would contact Josh or us or his attorney and discuss what had happened. There was no phone call, no email, no letter, no contact of any kind. We were notified January the 18th that she had indeed filed a response to his appeal. The grand jury no billed him on February the 5th and on February, on February the 3rd. And on February the 8th, Josh was called into the student conduct office and was handed a final expulsion letter from the president of the university and a lifetime no trespass order against him for any Auburn owned property. I was now labeled a rapist when I'm not a rapist. I didn't do anything wrong. And yet the school still says, oh, well, he did something wrong. And now here I am. I'm just a statistic. Rape does happen. Rape is a horrific, heinous crime. And the perpetrators should absolutely be prosecuted in the criminal justice system, not by a campus tribunal. We have police and criminal courts 
and judges and juries and district attorneys and defense attorneys that can handle those crimes. Campus tribunals should be listening to parking violations and plagiarism and academic dishonesty, cheating, vandalism in the dorm, theft in the dorm. They don't handle murder. They don't handle kidnapping. They shouldn't be handling rape. It's an inappropriate venue. So in short, my Eagle Scout, my child, who has been the most respectful young man, the kindest person has been expelled, has been branded a rapist, has a student record at the university that will be there for the rest of his life, will follow him for any background checks that are made, for any bar committee that he may ever want to sit for law school. He'll have to explain what happened for the rest of his life. And there's really no explanation for it because it's all based on a lie. Now, I'm part of that statistic. I'm part of that rape statistic. Now you, you hear about this constantly coming up in the media, this one in five, you know, this campuses are this, you know, this hotbed of, of sexual assault and rape. Well, w what about me? The Bureau of Justice has now come out and said that the actual rate of campus sexual assault is 0.06 percent, not 20 or 25 percent. Those numbers don't lie. That's the Bureau of Justice. Those are the numbers that the administration should be taking into consideration. Those are the numbers that Senator Gillibrand and Senator um, McCaskill should be taking into consideration. Not the one in five. That's not been a, it'll never be true just because you repeat it enough. My son was a victim of this whole hysteria because of the Dear Colleague letter of 2011. They have broadened the definition of what they consider to be sexual assault. They have lowered the standard of evidence from clear and convincing to preponderance, which is a 50.01% likelihood that something may or probably did happen. That's not what you want to use when you're going to change some, the course of someone's life forever. Clear and convincing is the absolute best standard to use. You hear about the Auburn family and, and the, the university that cares about its own people. They didn't care about me. I thought I was part of the family. Well, why did I get railroaded? It was, it was one of the hardest times, one of the, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is being at, at a place where you were so happy and having them turn around and basically shun you and, and turn their backs on you and treat you the way that Auburn treated me was horrible. Yes, universities need to be responsive to true sexual assault victims, but they also need to be responsive to accused students. Title IX is not just for women. Title IX applies to all students in this country, and all students should be protected equally. You don't forfeit your rights to constitutional protection when you pay your tuition or when you get a dorm room assignment or when you join a fraternity or a sorority. You have constitutional protections throughout your life if you're a U.S. citizen, particularly if you're a U.S. citizen. And those should never be infringed upon just because the federal government thinks that they need to force universities to give up funding if they don't perform the way they wish. I'm 24 now, and I was part of that rape statistic. I apparently raped someone and became one of the people that caused that one in five, when in reality, I didn't, and I don't, I don't understand it at all.